there are two main types of bearings. Linear bearings allow motion along a straight line, while rotary bearings allow circular motion. Linear bearings are not usually used in centrifugal pumps. Hence they will not be considered here. Rotary bearings are used primarily in pumps. To reduce friction. And position shafts and rotating components. Rotary bearings can be made to position shafts. Either axially. Or radially. Many bearings that can isolate radial motion can also isolate axial motion. Both axial and radial bearings can be of the plane type, the rolling element type, and the magnetic type. Plane rotary bearings allow two solid surfaces to come into contact, either directly, or with a thin fluid film separating them. Plane rotary bearings can be divided into two main types. The first, is plane axial bearings that can support an axial load. These are also known as plane thrust bearings. And second, plane radial bearings that can support a radial load. These are also known as journal bearings. A plane thrust bearing is made of two solid surfaces. One of the surfaces is usually stationary, and the other is free to slide against the stationary surface. The stationary surface is called the bearing, while the sliding surface is called the runner. The runner slides against the bearing's surface with a certain velocity v, while a lubricating film fills the space between them. A load acts perpendicularly to the mating surface of the two sliding solids. In the special case where the two surfaces do not come into direct contact, the pressure generated in the lubricating film fully supports the load that is pushing the surfaces together and prevents solid-to-solid -solid contact. The pressure distribution in the lubricating film is generated due to the movement of the runner that tends to drag the lubricant film into the wedge-shaped gap that exists between the two surfaces. This generates a sufficient pressure to support the load that is placed on the runner. Now we will talk about the operation of a journal bearing. A journal bearing is used to support a radial load to which a rotating shaft is subjected. If the journal bearing is made of a single piece, it is called a solid bushing. Two-piece journal bearings are split in the axial direction and offer greater flexibility when assembling and disassembling the bearing. Journal bearings sometimes have an oil groove, through which oil is pumped into the bearing. Similarly to the plane thrust bearing, a lubricant film exists between the rotating shaft and the stationary bearing. As the shaft rotates, the force acting on the shaft forces the shaft to be non-concentric with the bearing. The distance between the center of the shaft and the center of the bearing is called the eccentricity. As the shaft rotates, it drags the lubricant along with it into a narrow wedge-shaped gap between the shaft and the bearing. Due to the rotation of the shaft, a pressure is generated in the lubricant when it is forced through the wedge-shaped gap between the shaft and the journal bearing. In the special case where the shaft and bearing do not come into direct contact, the pressure generated in the lubricant is enough to lift the shaft and keep it from contacting the bearing. The nominal bearing load for a plane bearing is equal to the normal force that is acting on the bearing divided by the projected surface area of the bearing. For a plane thrust bearing, the projected area of the bearing is shown here in red. And the nominal load is equal to the normal force acting on the bearing divided by pi times the outer bearing radius squared. 
minus the inner bearing radius squared. Now let's look at the journal bearing. For a journal bearing, the projected area of the bearing is shown here in red. And the nominal load is equal to the normal force acting on the bearing. Divided by 2 times the bearing's bore radius times the length of the bearing. The nominal bearing load units are as follows. In the SI system, the bearing's nominal load has units of Pascal. While in the English system, it is usually measured in units of pounds per square inches. The sliding or surface velocity for a plane bearing is the average velocity of the moving element of the bearing, against the bearing's stationary surface. For a plane thrust bearing, the average sliding velocity is equal to the bearing's rotational speed in RPMs, or rotations per menu t, divided by 60, times 2 pi, times the average bearing radius, which is equal to the outer radius, plus the inner radius, divided by 2. Now let's look at the journal bearing. For a journal bearing, the average sliding velocity is equal to the bearing's rotational speed in RPMs, divided by 60, times 2 pi, times the bearing's bore radius. The bearing's sliding velocity has units of meters per second in the SI system, while in the English system, it is usually measured in units of feet per second. By multiplying the bearing's load by the bearing's surface velocity, we obtain the bearing's PV factor. This is an important bearing design parameter that measures the bearing's temperature rise due to friction and wear limits. The maximum value of the PV factor is often used as a design limit for plane bearings. There are seven distinct lubrication regimes that can occur in plane radial and thrust bearings. Hydrodynamic lubrication Hydrostatic lubrication Hybrid lubrication Boundary lubrication Mixed film lubrication Solid film lubrication And dry operation In hydrodynamic lubrications The bearing and runner or shaft are separated by a relatively thick film that prevents metal-to-metal -metal contact. The film fully supports the load that is placed on the runner or shaft. The pressure within the film is generated by the movement of the runner or shaft that forces the lubricant into a wedge-shaped gap between the moving part of the bearing system and the stationary part. Hydrodynamic lubrication is also known as fluid lubrication and full film lubrication. This is the regime in which journal bearings used in centrifugal pumps usually run under. In hydrostatic lubrication, similarly to hydrodynamic lubrication, the bearing and runner or shaft are separated by a relatively thick film that prevents metal-to-metal -metal contact. The film fully supports the load that is placed on the runner or shaft. The pressure within the film is supplied by a source that is external to the bearing. Thus the lubrication of the interface between the moving and stationary parts of the bearings, does not require movement. Bearings with this lubrication regime are hence used when the speed is small. The lubricant in hydrostatic lubrication can be a liquid or a gas that is introduced into the bearing under high pressure. In hybrid lubrication, both hydrodynamic and hydrostatic lubrication are taking place simultaneously during the bearing's operation. In this case, the lubricant is supplied under a high pressure.
and the movement of the shaft or runner also generates a pressure in the lubricant. In boundary, or thin film lubrication, the bearing and runner or shaft are separated by a relatively thin, film. That does not completely prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact. The film does not support the load that is placed on the runner or shaft. Instead, the load is fully carried by the solid-to-solid -solid contact between the surface asperities on the stationary and the moving parts of the bearing. The role of the lubricant in this case is not to carry the load but only to reduce the coefficient of friction between the two mating solid surfaces of the bearing. Grease is often used in boundary lubrication situations. Due to the high heat and wear rate generated with boundary lubrication, it is undesirable to operate bearings in this lubrication regime. A number of factors can cause a bearing that is operating in the hydrostatic or hydrodynamic regimes to run in the boundary lubrication regime. For bearings operating in the hydrodynamic regime, a drop in the runner or shaft speed can cause the pressure in the lubricant to drop. This usually happens when the bearing has just started moving, or when it is about to stop. The low pressure in the lubricant, can cause the moving and stationary surfaces to come closer together and the lubrication regime can change to boundary lubrication. For bearings operating in the hydrostatic regime, a drop in the lubricant supply pressure, can similarly cause a switch to the boundary lubrication regime. High bearing loads in both the hydrostatic and hydrodynamic lubrication regimes can also cause the bearings stationary and moving surfaces to come closer together to the point where the lubrication regime switches to boundary lubrication. Misalignment between the runner or shaft and the bearing can also cause all, or part of the bearing to be running under boundary lubrication conditions. In hydrodynamic lubrication, a drop in the lubricant's viscosity, can reduce the load bearing capacity of the lubricant, causing the bearing's stationary and moving parts to move closer together, to the point where boundary lubrication can take place. The lubricant's viscosity can be reduced due to high operating temperatures or lubricant degradation. In mixed film lubrication, the load is partially carried by the lubrication film, and partially carried by contact between the surface asperities on the stationary and moving parts of the bearing. In the mixed film lubrication regime, the friction coefficient between the bearing, and the shaft or runner increases quickly as the lubrication regime approaches the boundary lubrication case. Shown here is a plot of the coefficient of friction between the bearing, and the shaft or runner, versus the lubricant's viscosity, times the surface velocity, divided by the bearing's nominal load. We will call this the hydrodynamic parameter. From the plot, let's look and see how the coefficient of friction, varies with the lubrication regime. In the boundary lubrication regime, the coefficient of friction is highest and nearly constant. As the value of the hydrodynamic parameter increases, we enter the mixed film lubrication regime, where the coefficient of friction decreases rapidly. When operating near the boundary lubrication regime, there is nearly continuous contact between the surface asperities on the bearing, and those on the shaft or runner. As we get closer to the transition point from mixed film lubrication, to hydrodynamic lubrication, the contact between the solid surfaces of the bearing, becomes more intermittent. Finally as the hydrodynamic parameter increases past the transition point, we go into the hydrodynamic lubrication regime, where the friction coefficient increases slowly, with the hydrodynamic parameter. Consider the graph of the friction coefficient versus the hydrodynamic parameter, which is defined as the viscosity times the surface velocity. 
divided by the bearing's nominal load. The region to the right of the transition point on the graph is said to be the stable lubrication region. This is due to the fact that changes in the lubricant's condition are self-correcting, in this region. For example, if the temperature of a bearing that is operating in the stable lubrication region increases slightly, this would cause a decrease in the value of the lubricant's viscosity. A corresponding decrease would also occur in the hydrodynamic parameter. This would cause the friction coefficient to also decrease. The decrease in the friction coefficient would then decrease the amount of energy lost to friction. And hence would limit the temperature rise of the lubricant. Hence the lubricant's viscosity would tend to increase again, due to the lower temperature. This is what is meant by changes in the lubricant's condition being self-correcting. On the other hand, the region to the left of the transition point is called the unstable lubrication region, since changes in the lubricant are amplified in this unstable region. Let's take for example, a bearing that is operating in this region. As the temperature of the bearing increases, the viscosity of the lubricant decreases, which means that the hydrodynamic parameter also decreases. This in turn causes the friction coefficient to increase. This causes more energy to be lost as friction. And hence the temperature of the bearing increases even further. Hence the changes in the lubricant are amplified, in the unstable lubrication region. In solid film lubrication, the lubricant between the bearing's stationary and moving parts, is made of graphite or a similar material such as molybdenum disulfide. Bearings that use this type of lubrication, can operate at very high temperatures. Some types of self-lubricating bearings, can operate without the introduction of any lubricant. Between their stationary and moving mating surfaces. Some bearing materials, such as Teflon, can operate under these conditions without a need for any lubrication. Sometimes, the bearing material can encapsulate an amount of lubricant that is used primarily to reduce the friction between the bearing, and the runner or shaft. This type of bearing operation is limited to applications that involve a small load, and a slow rotational speed. In general, Dry bearing operation is not suitable for industrial pumping applications. Plain bearings offer many advantages. For one thing, they are simple, and therefore are relatively inexpensive to purchase. Plain bearings are reliable, and have a very high load capacity due to a lack of moving parts. Very little maintenance is required, as there are no moving parts except for the shaft. Plain bearings also have some disadvantages. There are usually no apparent signs of impending failure. Indications of impending plain bearing failure are usually revealed using used lubricant analysis techniques. This method only works for bearings that have a closed lubricating system. Bearings that are lubricated using the pumped fluid, cannot be analyzed with this method. For more information about used lubricant analysis, Click on the shown link. When a plain bearing does fail, it is typically a catastrophic failure. Plain radial bearings must fit closely to their shaft. This can present a problem if there are extreme temperature changes. The clearance between the shaft and the bearing is very small, and thermal growth may cause the gap to close if the shaft or bearing are overheated. This thermal growth would then cause shaft to bearing contact with the associated lockup and damage to the shaft. Rolling element bearings, can be classified based on the direction of the major force that the bearing is designed to support. As radial bearings, and axial or thrust bearings. Based on the geometry of the rolling element, the bearings can also be classified as ball bearings, where the rolling elements are spherical. And roller bearings, 
where the rolling elements are more or less cylindrical. 